Hey everyone, welcome to episode one of Trucking the Seven Seas. Uh, in this episode, we're going to go over the first two weeks at night transportation. Uh, we stayed west coast for the last two weeks and uh, ran into quite a few issues, one mechanical and uh, one being the other being the weather, specifically snow. Uh, currently in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, going to deliver a load tomorrow at 5 a.m., but that load is not going to be on here. That's going to be on uh, next episode. But for now, uh, let's get into it. Okay, so I made the spreadsheet. Uh, just did it myself real quick. Didn't take me too long. And uh, we're going to go over every load I had, uh, how long it was, the rate per mile, and the per diem. I'll explain that in a second. Layover, total amount, and then total rate per mile as long as, along with uh, all the issues I ran into. So, start off, give you an overview of everything. These numbers are the load number. You can pretty much ignore those. Those are just for me, really. Obviously, uh, shipper receiver, that's just where I picked up and dropped off the loads. Miles, rate per mile, earnings per mile, the per diem I was paid, which I'll explain that in a second. Any layover, total amount I earned, and then the total rate per mile. And then uh, these are just some notes that um, we'll talk about here in a minute. So, as far as pay goes, so you're going to see the pay right here, and uh, obviously this is extremely low pay, but what they do at night is you can choose to have a low rate per mile and then take the per, the per diem, and what this does is it's a tax, a tax advantaged pay, and Basically, you get paid a lower rate per mile, but you get the per diem, which is taxed at a lower rate. So that means both, I think you definitely pay less taxes and also the company pays less taxes as well. So um, yeah, so that's why this rate, the base rate is so low, but then I just get a kickback in the form of per diem. And this per diem right here is taxed at a lower rate. So uh, it's better for everyone except the government. Uh, but, uh, you know, who, who cares about them? Just going to get right into it. Uh, I'll, uh, post a picture of the various pay charts. Uh, you'll see it, uh, and I guess I'll put it probably right around here. If you can see my mouse here, of uh, the, uh, different pay charts. Um, basically you should always go for, uh, a lower rate per mile and per diem rather than uh, just get a higher rate per mile because they offer you a higher rate per mile without per diem but you actually get less at the end of the day because the higher rate per mile is taxed at a higher amount than taking a lower rate and then taking per diem okay so it's a little confusing it's mostly like a tax um, advantage way of getting paid and uh, it's complex and a little convoluted but I debated to e whether I was even going to show this but I think you guys should know there's two ways to get paid at night one is just a uh, voluntarily take a lower rate per mile and then get per diem and uh, pay less taxes or just get a higher rate per mile and pay more taxes to me and it does make sense to take the lower rate per mile and then get the per diem and per diem is like what a company can pay its employees for food and housing and things like this. And uh, I, I don't even think it's tax actually. So that's why it's better to take the per diem and the lower rate per mile. So that's what that's all about. But at the end of the, the day, all that's really going to matter when we talk about this is the total rate per mile. This is what I actually got paid. And uh, let me get to that here in a second. Don't uh, jump the gun on that. Anyways, so uh, first load. Uh, I'm based out of Las Vegas. That's where I picked up my truck. And uh, by the way, Knight has terminals all over the country. Uh, in basically most every major city. I think there's like 20 or 30 of them. But I'm based out of Las Vegas. And uh, that's where I picked up this truck. And that's where I picked up my first load in Las Vegas, Nevada. I went from Las Vegas, Nevada to Fife, Washington, which is up by Tacoma, Washington, which is near Seattle, Washington. That was 1114 miles paid the base rate is 36 cents per mile they see different rates here 
the longer the load, the lower the rate, which is pretty normal. So that's why there's different rates here. So the base rate was 36 cents per mile, and that gave me $401.04. But then I got per diem of $133.68. Okay. And then I had a layover, which I'll explain here in a second. These are all actually dollars. Let me change that. That's easy to read. So that's uh, $401 plus $133 plus $75 equals $609.72, which brought the total rate per mile on that load to 55 cents per mile. So about this layover, um, so if you're new to trucking uh, and you work for a company, when you get your first truck, it's almost always going to have an issue. There have been very few trucks where I've actually just stepped into them and they were just working great. These only been a couple times. Usually, even if it comes like right out of the mechanic shop, there's uh, unfortunately there's there's usually just something wrong with it. You know, the inverter doesn't work, the cruise control doesn't work. I've had that happen. Uh, you know, there's something wrong with it. In this case, the Zonar, which is our electronic log logbook software, um, it wasn't working properly. So. It's supposed to automatically kick into drive and start logging your drive time when you go over five miles an hour. But mine wasn't doing that. So I ended up taking up taking off from Las Vegas, Nevada. And I went like maybe an hour or something. And uh, I realized it, it didn't kick into drive. And sometimes it does that. And sometimes you just gotta kind of undock it, clean out the uh, connectors and put it back in and then it'll start working again. But I did that, I tried all the tricks and did everything I could. And I uh, kept trying over and over and I couldn't get it to work. It just would not kick into drive. So I was having to manually go into drive every time I wanted to go into drive, which is super annoying. And it also wasn't logging my, uh, it just wasn't logging my hours the way it should have been uh, to simplify it, which is a big problem. So that needed to get fixed. And by the time I realized that I, I just wasn't gonna be able to fix it, I was already like a couple hundred miles down the road because I had been trying different tricks because sometimes things like this happen. Uh, so I tried everything to get it fixed myself, but I just, it there was something wrong with it. And uh, I just realized I wasn't gonna be able to fix it. So I uh, kept driving with it because at that point I was already kind of too far down the road uh, to bring it back to the shop and drove it up to Fife, Washington, let my DM know, hey, I can't, can't keep going. There's something wrong with my logbook. And uh, he said, okay, after I dropped that load, I grabbed a short load. Uh, I deadheaded down to Longview, Washington, grabbed a load there and dropped it in Portland. That was only like 50 miles. And then there was like 100 miles of deadhead, which made it 149 miles. And then there's a night has a shop in Portland. So then I went over to the Portland yard. They looked at it, took them about a day to fix and they were able to fix it there was apparently some electronic unit in there called i think they called it the b4 i'm not going to pretend i actually understand that but it looked like a like a modem on your internet like an internet modem you have at home and they replaced that and then that fixed it, it started working again so i guess actually this layover should be here instead now that i'm thinking about it yeah so a dollar four so that went way up because it was a it was a really short load. So that's why that went up to all the way up to a dollar. But uh, yeah, so that fixed it, and uh, that cost me a day though. But we're back on the road, and I haven't had any issues since. But just know, worked for a couple companies, and basically every time I've stepped into a new truck, there's usually something wrong with it. So you know, if you're new and you come in, and you get oh sweet, I got my truck. Just mentally be prepared to take it to the shop, especially right now with such a mechanic shortage and the part shortage and everything going on. Uh, just be prepared to take it into the shop and uh, lose a day. I, I, that's, I, I think that would be a very healthy attitude to have because uh, it, it just happens quite a lot. So after that, I got a load uh, from Medford, Oregon to Yuba City. And this load was an interesting one because I did hit it down from Portland to Medford, which is basically the entire length of Oregon is maybe like 400 mile deadhead or something like that. It was quite far. And it was actually 
a relay because some guy had his truck blow up in Medford, Oregon, and he was at a Freightliner shop, and you know he just broke down there. So I went into the Freightliner shop. They had the trailer in their back lot, hooked up to it, grabbed his uh, uh, the bill lading, and uh, yeah, he was inside the shops, and so we had to go into his truck, and they had his entire engine. There, there wasn't an engine in the vehicle, so you know, uh, obviously he blew up the engine. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I never got the backstory. So picked that one up in Yuba or uh, Medford, Oregon. Relayed it there. While I was in Medford, Oregon, I went ahead, got it scaled, and I mean, you know, I think I got the photo. Do I have the photo? Yeah. So I got the photo. So now I'm gonna put the photo. I guess. Because if I'm in the lower half right here, which I'm planning to be, oops, oops. So if I'm in the lower half right there, I think I'll put the photo kind of right, right over here, of the weight of this, uh, of the trailer. You can see the weight, which should be right there. I'll put it there. Drive axle is twenty-nine thousand one hundred, which is fine, and then the trailer axle is thirty-five thousand eight hundred, which is not fine. That's about two thousand pounds overweight. This is interesting because I'm headed to California, so the weight absolutely needs to be correct. And this individual didn't scale it. So I know he didn't scale it because uh, the tandems, which is the trailer axle, wasn't all the way forward. So he had more weight on the trailer than he needed to because you can adjust the weight based on where the trailer uh, or where the tandems are. And he didn't even bother to do that. So I pushed the tandems all the way forward to try to get as much weight off of them as I could, but that still didn't fix it. So uh, this load was like, it was a Walmart load, so it was probably, I think it was like canned goods or something like that. So I knew I can get away with this. Uh, basically what I did was I kind of drove at five miles an hour and just slammed on the brakes, which shot weight forward toward the drive axle and I don't recommend doing this unless you absolutely have to. And I kind of had to in this instance because this guy picked this thing up in Tacoma, Washington and then drove it all the way down to Medford, Oregon, which was about, yeah, about 800 miles overweight. I don't know how he didn't get a ticket. Uh, that part's amazing to me how he didn't get a ticket and also amazing to me that he didn't bother to scale it. It was like 44,000 pounds. So uh, what were you thinking? Anyways. So I shoot it forward, I shoot it forward a couple times, and uh, I get the weight correct. I do not recommend doing that normally. I just knew I was carrying like canned goods and it was it was probably fine. Or maybe it was some, I don't quite remember what it was. I just looked at it and realized, yeah, I can, I can do that. Uh, it was a Walmart load. So I fixed it. Again, I don't recommend doing that unless you're kind of stuck, which I was because, yep, yeah, I was headed to California, this thing, got picked up in Tacoma and there was really only one way to fix it without bringing it all the way back to the shipper. So I did that, worked out. Again, don't do that unless you know what you're doing. Anyways, I fixed it. Yeah, so I picked that up in Medford, Oregon and went down to Yuba City, California. So my drive time was about 610 miles. He drove it about 800 miles before he blew up his engine. That paid 36 mile cents per mile, the base rate which earned me $219, and then the per diem was another 73, equaling 292. And then the total rate per mile on that was 48 cents, which again is low. Uh, bear with me, I need to explain the safety mileage and all that good stuff. This is uh, significant here. So just, yeah, this is low. This is low, just hold on. Okay, and then after that, I picked up another one. Uh, it wasn't in Yuba City, I, it was another drop and hook relay. I think I picked it up in Lodi, which is just north of Yuba City, but either way, Yuba City is close enough. So for this, we're going to say I picked it up in Yuba City. Same idea, 368 miles, 36 cents, $132, plus $0.44 cent dollars per diem, 176 for $0.48 cents per mile. After that, and that one was going to Linwood, California. And then when I was in Linwood, California, I picked up another one. That was going to Long Beach, California. That was really that was a really short load, 121 miles. Again, shorter loads pay more. It was only 50 bucks. wasn't worth it at all because I was in uh, 
uh, Los Angeles traffic, but whatever. This one was just a quick one. Fourteen dollars per diem. Not, you know, if I got nothing but these loads, I'd I'd quit. But this one was the worst load as far as mileage goes. But it did pay fifty four cents a mile. Still, still not worth it to drive into California like that. But whatever, because after that, I got one going from Irvine, California, to Aurora, Colorado, which is nice load, thousand miles over a thousand. 36 cents per mile, $379 for that one, plus 126 per diem, $500, 48 cents, you can kind of see how this works. And then, so after that one, it went from uh, Denver, Colorado to Corinne, Utah, uh, 542 miles, yeah, you, can, you can see the amount. In total, I got $260 for that, 48 cents per mile. However, um, on this load, I, I didn't really want it because there was a snowstorm coming uh, from Canada, basically, and kind of moving down right over the Rockies and Wyoming area. Uh, and I saw it coming, and at first I was like, do you have anything else? Because this could be a problem. And uh, my DM's like, nah, it's, I don't, you know, there's, there's not much coming out of Denver. So I'm like, oh, okay. So it had me going up to Cheyenne and then taking the 80 to Salt Lake. But I realized the storm was going to hit me right as I was going uh, you know, on that 80. I'm like, I, I'm just not going to make it. But I realized, okay, you know what? Actually, the 70 through the Rockies is clear right now. I can I can beat it because it's a dropping hook. So that was a quick dropping hook. So that's what I did. I grabbed it, and then I started making a beeline to the 70, just trying to beat this storm, which I had plenty of time. Like I had like three or four hours before this storm uh, was going to get to the Rockies and really you know, start peppering me. So I'm going, and I get basically all the way through the Rockies, and I'm only about maybe 100 miles east of uh, Grand Junction. Still kind of in the Rockies, but, you know, through the heat of it. And I'm going west on the 70, and all of a sudden, just tra traffic just stops. Like, it, it just stops. And I'm like, oh, oh Jesus. Like, what's going on here? And it just stops. And then, after about 20 minutes of not moving, just, I see something I really don't want to see. I start seeing hazmat emergency vehicles start passing me, a couple of them. And right then I know, okay, a hazmat tanker has just rolled over on the 70, and we're going to be here a while, and there's a storm coming. So I'm like, oh, crap. Oh, jeez. So I just pull off in the shoulder, and I'm there for maybe a half hour or something, another half hour, so almost an hour at this point. And then the uh, state trooper, you know, because the entire shoulder is full of semis at this point. And the state trooper says, hey, semis, get off the road. You just, you know, go somewhere else, basically. And, you know, the Rockies aren't exactly known for their truck parking. Imagine that. So I'm like, okay, okay. But I get off, and I, I kind of go east. And... Um, I go to some small town. I forget the name of it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put it right here. Maybe I'll even try to find the place if I can find it. Uh, I ended up just parking in like some random, like uh, like a small shopping mall kind of area parking lot. And I'm definitely not supposed to be there. But there's like five other trucks who are just sort of parked in that general area too, because there's just trucks everywhere. I mean, the, the, the freeway shut down and there's just trucks everywhere all over this, this very small town, uh, but it, it's, it's just nowhere to go, right? So I'm parked there and I'm like, okay. And then I walk into the busiest place I can see, which is the restaurant. And I kind of go up to the manager. And I'm like, hey, uh, the freeway shut down. I'm parked in your lot. C can you please just, you know, let me park there for a bit? Real nice guy. I said, yeah, yeah, you're good, man. No problem. Like, oh, sweet. It was a Mexican restaurant, so I went ahead and, you know, I had myself some uh, some delicious Mexican food. I think I had some uh, enchilada, enchiladas or something like that. Really good food, uh, which is always kind of cool. You know, you're out there on the road, and then you find yourself eating at some really nice restaurant in the middle of the Rockies. Kind of cool, but in this case, it wasn't that cool because I mentioned the storm, and I'm just sitting there as I'm eating and just waiting, just just looking at Google Maps and looking at uh, the Colorado DOT Twitter page, uh, just waiting for the freeway to open. 
after about three or four hours, right when that storm is about to hit, the freeway finally opens, and I'm like, all right, I got to get out of here. I get back in the truck, start driving. There's a bunch of traffic because the freeway just reopened, and it, it just starts dumping on us. Snow all over the place. I mean, I... <laughs> I planned well to miss this, but then the tanker just rolled over on me, and we're just getting it. And it takes me, I, I'm worried I'm going to have to chain up, but they don't make us chain up, thankfully. But it takes me about, about two hours to go maybe 50 miles, and then I finally get out of it, I get past Grand Junction, and I go into, I think, it was, I think I hit Utah before I stopped, I stopped at like a Love's or something like that. That's where I stopped for the night. So, didn't get far at all on that one. Maybe only a f like 300 miles or something, and I hit a bunch of snow. Real rough. But it gets worse. Because that same storm kind of started to come down toward Nevada. So, I dropped this load in Utah, and then they want me to take a load to Lathrop. Lathrop? Lathrop? I don't know how to say it. Lathrop, California which is, of course, right across the 80 there. And the, and the storm kind of keeps coming, although Nevada isn't getting it as bad as Wyoming and Denver. It's still getting it. So I start going, and I wait till like 10 o'clock or something to start moving. I'm, it goes in Wells, Nevada. So I was already in Nevada. And I wait till like, I don't know, 9 or 10 o'clock or something like that. And I'm like, all right. I, I know the storm kind of hit here, but surely Nevada has, you know, brined and salted it and plowed it all nice and good we should be okay okay right that was my assumption that they did something to the road well they didn't they, they didn't do anything so i start driving and i'm just on snowpack there's it hasn't been plowed it hasn't been brined hasn't been anything there's no excuse because the storm has already passed and i'm like what what is this but i'm going and i'm like okay whatever it's just you know just take it nice and slow and just get past it by the time uh by the time I hit about Winnemucca, that's the time it should start to clear up. So I'm like, all right, I'll just get to Winnemucca. But I'm going, and I'm going, and I haven't seen a single snow plow, and this thing is not brined or anything, and it, there's quite a bit of snow on the road. And I'm just like looking, and I'm like, this is pretty bad. And then I finally see the one thing I really did not want to see, which was, you probably see the note over here, chains. So chain lights are on. I'm like, oh, okay. So I've never had to actually, this is the first time I've ever act, had to actually chain it. Uh, I did have to do it in a shipper and I've done it in practice. And you know, one time I got stuck in a shipper's lot and I just had to chain just to get out of the shipper's lot, but that's a little bit different. This is the first time I'm ever, I'm ever actually chaining on a freeway. I'm like, okay. So I get to the side of the road, throw the chains on, takes me about a half hour, uh, put the bungees on, do all the good stuff. And I start driving up the this uh, I'm on the 80 and I'm driving up the road and then start to go and it's pretty clear you know the road's pretty clear so I'm like okay I got chains on and I had seen multiple semis just blow this thing and I'm like oh, okay <laughs> which okay it's a brave man up there right but I you know I, I'm chaining it I don't want to get like a thousand dollar ticket so you know I start going with the chains on I do the right thing and I'm going up the hill and the right lane's pretty clear still, so I'm like, all right, I got chains on. So I just get in the left-hand lane because it has snow in it, which I got chains on, so, you know, why wouldn't, why not? I'll go in that lane. So I'm going up the hill, I'm going up the hill, and it's pretty damn clear. Like, I'm looking at the right-hand lane going, there's nothing in that lane right now. There must be something ahead, right? Because I'm going, I am going up a hill. Um, so I get to the top of the hill, basically. And there's, no, there's not much. Like, I'm in the left-hand lane, and the left-hand lane is starting to clear up. And I'm like, okay, this this actually needs to get worse if I'm going to have these chains on. And I get to the top of the hill, and then I start going down the hill, and it is totally clear. Both lanes are completely clear. And I'm like, what, why do I have these on right now? So I start going down the hill, and the road's totally clear, and I got chains on, and I am just hammering the road right now with these chains, because they're just eating into the pavement. And I'm going, I'm like, uh, okay, I, I'm gonna, I think I should take these things off, because now I'm starting to go downhill, and I just don't see anything. And, you know, I kind of, you know, I start to pick up a little bit of speed, because, it, like, the road is completely clear, and at this point, there's other cars just kind of blown by me, and I'm like, uh. 
And I'm just hamburgering the road the whole time because there is no snow at all. So I'm going, and then finally, you know, I'm going faster than you should with chains because there's no snow. And finally, one of the chains comes off, and I'm like, okay, I'm done. So I just immediately get over, pull the chains off, throw them in there, keep going. And the road was completely clear for the rest of the way. So I think what happened there was I went past that chain sign, pulled over, and then pretty much as soon as I got past it, they removed the chain requirement. But, you know, I, I didn't see that because I was already past the sign that said chains required. So I start putting them on. And, uh, yeah, that was my first experience of having to actually chain, and it was totally unnecessary. Um, so I took that one. I ended up stopping in Winnemucca, Nevada, and just staying the night because while Min Winnemucca, Nevada, to Reno was actually pretty clear. Uh, I was looking on the map, and Reno was getting just dumped on, completely dumped on with snow. And I looked at the, uh, there's like a Nevada chain requirement map page. I think it's like nevada.dot.dot.gov or something like that. And all of Reno had chain requirements. Just the entire thing just showed chain requirements from basically the start of Nevada or the start of Reno all the way up to Truckee and into California. So I'm like, okay, I'm just done for the day. So I stayed in Windmucker for the night. I uh, had a good time there and uh, just hung out until the next day. Next day, got up and completed the load to Lothrop, Lothrop, California. Dropped it. The roads were completely clear by then. They had properly snowed and plowed and brined them all the way into California, dropped that one into California. And, uh, that was a few days ago. So these are the first two checks. Um, there's been a couple other loads since then, but since I haven't gotten paid for them, I'm not going to go over them in this video. They'll be in the next video. You can see the pay here all the way down. So the base rate, and I'll explain this now, the base rate you see kind of right here, or the total rate per mile you see right here, uh, again, this is like the base rate, and then the per diem also counts in the rate per mile. So what you need to pay attention to is the total rate per mile. Since this was my first uh, two weeks, I didn't get any safety bonus. I didn't get any mileage bonus that I'm aware of. At least I haven't gotten paid for any mileage bonus yet. Uh, I don't think I got a fuel bonus. And I don't think I got an efficiency bonus. So the efficiency bonus, so safety is obviously pretty easy. Just don't get any accidents or whatever. Don't harsh break 15 times in a month or whatever. Mileage is, uh, well, I'll, I'll put it again right here. I'll put a little pamphlet right here. And uh, uh, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. For the mile, well, I actually got it right here. Yeah, so you should see this right here if I don't show it to you. But the mileage bonus uh complete 8750 miles you get one percent per mile another one percent per mile then 9500 you get another cent per mile 10250 another cent per mile and then 11,000 miles in a single month you get another cent per mile equal to a total of four cents per mile i didn't come close to that because it was you know, it was only at it for two weeks and then there's a fuel bonus if you get an average of 7.2 miles per gallon you get an extra penny. Again, I wasn't eligible because it's my first couple weeks. And then again, the safety bonus, you know, just don't crash your car, your truck. And the efficiency bonus is if you get uh, the fuel bonus, the safety bonus, and at least must be, and at least 9,500 miles in a single month, you get an extra two cents per mile. So I didn't get any of that because again, I'm going at it for two weeks. So, you know, this adds up quite a bit, but in the end, I got, got a hidden one here. Go ahead and unhide it. Nope, wrong way. There's, okay. So first month total. So I only drove 4,700 miles. I had a zonar issue and then a bunch of snow. So in only two weeks, so I just, I just didn't make it. I did get paid 2,352 miles or dollars. This is pre-tax. I'm not going to go into tax because everybody's taxes are going to be different. So this is pre-tax. This is before the government takes its cut, which in this case equals 50 cents per mile, which isn't good. That's not good at all. But again, 
I didn't get any of this. So normally I think you're probably going to get uh, an extra five cents, probably five to eight cents average per mile. Maybe bring this up to, you know, 50 to 55 to 58 cents per mile, something like that. Um, now, if you're new, I do get slightly higher base pay. Mine's about two cents higher uh, based on my experience. So just noted that maybe mine is about two cents from all of this, roughly speaking, um, if you're brand new. So you're looking at about 55 cents per mile. And uh, yeah, as far as mega carrier pay, that's, that's pretty standard. And if you're new, uh, you're probably going to get about that no matter where you go. Uh, you can go to Knight or Swift or JB Hunt or Westerner Express or wherever, but I, they're all they're all about that much, okay? That's starting pay, with very few exceptions. It's about 55 or so cents per mile is starting pay. And if you run 120,000 miles, 55,000, I mean, you're going to somewhere between 60 and $70,000 per year for your first year. I'm looking to go lease operator and try that here in the next six to eight months or so. Uh, just sort of kicking the can down the road. But, you know, if you're new or you're just looking at night, there you have it. Not the best. This is not the best couple weeks at all. Hit a lot of snow, had the mechanical issue. And yeah, this just wasn't a good couple weeks, if I'm being honest. Um, but, uh, yeah, there you go. First couple weeks at night. I like night. You know, I started with night. They're who got my, got my CDL through. No force dispatch, no none of that. Uh, and there's a lot of terminals around. So right now I'm in Salt Lake City, and they got a terminal in Salt Lake City, so I'm in their terminal right now, which is always nice. And, uh, yeah, the pay is, you know, pretty standard for a mega carrier, I would say. If you're interested, or you're, maybe you want to uh, try trucking, Knight does pay for your CDL. So they'll pay you to come to CDL school, and then they give you a job right out of CDL school. Assuming you don't do something crazy at CDL school, they'll give you a job, you know, barring you do some, doing something insane. Uh, and then I think you work for them for something like nine months or something like that. And then if you work for them for nine months, you don't have to pay back the tuition for your CDL school, which when I was there, it was like 3000 or something like that. So, you know, but if you work for them for, I think it was, I think it's nine months. I'll have to check. Uh, you get, uh, uh, your, your, you get a CDL and you don't have to pay for it. They'll pay for it. But you just have to work for them for like nine months. And in that nine months, you know, uh, you'll make about 50 to 55 cents per mile. Uh, probably closer to 55. So. And if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the comment and uh, go ahead and apply to them if you're interested. But, you know, thanks for watching, guys. And uh, I'll leave you with a cutout of uh, the Sierra Nevada here, I think it is. Or maybe the Grapevine. I'm not sure which one I'm using. I haven't made it yet. But anyways, thanks for watching, guys. I guess like and su subscribe and comment down below and uh here's a cutout of either the grapevine or the sierra nevada here we go